Welcome back, guys. This is Jason. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. How prepared are you if that warning just came across your TV? September is National Preparedness Month in the United States, and while many YouTube channels focus on all kinds of preparedness topics, here on this channel we focus on emergency communications. In the spirit of Preparedness Month, let's discuss some of the things we can do to sharpen our skill set and get us better prepared for disaster communications. Disasters come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, from very localized disasters like tornadoes or chemical spills, to much more widespread disasters like hurricanes and earthquakes. You have to look at your area and decide what is most likely to occur in the region you live. Regardless of the threats to your region, we all need power. Without power, the radio is little more than a boat anchor that will accomplish nothing for us if we lose commercial power. You may choose to power your radio with a generator, but what will power the radio if you cannot resupply the gasoline required to run the generator? Now, while I have a generator on hand, I've chosen a 10 amp hour Dakota lithium battery along with a 30 watt foldable solar panel to power my radio setup. Testing during fill day this past June showed me both the pros and cons of this setup. While the setup is very lightweight, the 10 amp hour battery just didn't have enough stored energy to keep up with the demands of a fill day deployment. However, it did last me for several hours of heavy, constant use after the sun went down. In an emergency, I doubt that much demand would be put on the battery. Still, it left me questioning my setup. Moving forward, I will be upgrading to a larger battery, but I wouldn't have realized that I needed a larger battery had I have not gone out and tested my setup. You can't possibly know the limits of your power setup if you don't get out into the field and test. There are many ways to test your setup and have fun at the same time. Field day is just one of those events during the year. There's also parks on the air, summits on the air, state QSO parties, and many other opportunities each year to go portable and see what your power setup is capable of. Even without leaving the comforts of your shack, you can always unplug from commercial power and run your station for a weekend on emergency power to see how well it can perform. Let's challenge ourselves to operate for 24 hours using only emergency power at least quarterly over the next year. I think most of us are bound to learn something new about our stations and its capability. A few final thoughts about power. We need to choose equipment that gives us the best bang for the buck in terms of power requirements. It's one of the main reasons that I use the Raspberry Pi for digital modes in ham radio. The Pi draws around 300 milliamps from a 12 volt source. The Pi and the 857 together draw less than one amp per hour on receive, which means I can get around nine hours of service from that 10 amp hour battery even if I don't plug up the solar panel. Also, you might want to consider adding battery checks to your calendar if your batteries aren't on a trickle charger. I have it on my calendar to check my batteries every three months and charge as needed. Now that we have power covered, we need a communications plan in place long before a disaster strikes. I've covered this topic recently and will leave a link to that video right up above. The communications plan will allow us to communicate with those we care about most. This is relatively easy if the entire family has a ham license, but we all know this is seldom the case. So how will you communicate with those that don't have a license? Our society has become so dependent upon cell phones, yet they are most often the first thing to fail during a disaster. Even if the towers are up and running, they can quickly become overloaded with everyone trying to make a call at once. 
At a bare minimum, we should establish meeting places that the family can rally to during an emergency. I recommend having several meeting places in case one or more is inaccessible during a disaster. Now, to communicate with those outside the affected area, we can use our radios to send text messages and email over RF. Which method you choose will determine if two-way communication is possible. You can use JSA Call to send text and email, but it can receive neither. WinLink, on the other hand, can send and receive both text messages and email. APRS is another possibility for sending and receiving text messages. We've covered many of these possibilities on the channel before. I'll leave a link to a few of those in the description below. Now, maybe you have ham radio friends in and out of the affected area. Communicating with them can give you real-time information that probably won't be found on local radio or TV broadcasts. It can alert you to problems in your area, such as rioting or looting or even localized flooding. But how will you communicate with other hams in your group? <laughs> yeah, I know, it sounds like a dumb question, but hear me out on this. What frequency will you use? Will it be voice or digital? Will you be using a repeater? What's your plan if the repeater is offline? What time will everyone be on the air? See what I mean? If you choose to use voice as your primary means of communications, you better have a well-established plan for everyone in your group to follow, or just accept the luck of the draw when you throw out your call sign. A better way to communicate might be something like JSA Call or WinLink. Both applications can be left unattended and still receive messages from other operators. WinLink can listen in a peer-to-peer -peer format or JS8 Call in its native format. JS8 Call has the ability to work even under bad propagation conditions, and WinLink offers the ability to move lots of data at a much quicker pace than JS8 Call. Knowing both of these modes will serve you well during a disaster. Consider this scenario. I set up my station and leave it running JS8 Call while I attend to other urgent needs following a disaster. One of my friends in the next town over is able to see my station online and leave a message for me. When I check my station next, I will see his message about a proposed time to use 2 meter simplex on a given frequency at a later time to catch up with one another and discuss current events. I didn't have to babysit the radio and the message still came through loud and clear. Now you're getting the idea of how efficient it is in both time and power consumption to use something like JS8 Call to communicate during and after a disaster. Last thing to consider before we close. We can also use these same systems to help friends and neighbors communicate with their loved ones as well. This can be a very valuable asset during a disaster. Taking the time to build, test, and learn the equipment and modes can have a great benefit in a time of crisis. If that dreaded warning flashed across your TV screen right now, how prepared are you? Until next time, 7-3. It can alert you to problems in your area, such as rioting or loot. WinLink, on the other hand, can receive and send. <clears throat> a few thought. Blah, 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 blah. At a bare minimum, we should establish meeting places that the family can rally to during an emergency.